My name is James True. I am managing editor here at the site. Joining me today is Dr. Poppy Crum from, you're the chief scientist at Dolby Labs, correct? Yes, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for joining us. We're going to talk a little bit about the science behind uh, Dolby's technology with audio visual, uh, and in particular emotions, I think is going to be coming up a little bit here. The two big things that you guys are working on right now are uh, vision and Atmos, right? Those are the, probably the most recognizable uh, technologies, correct? Yes, probably. So, and Dolby Voice as oh, well. Good. But when it comes to, I want to sort of give an idea, give a flavor of how your work translates into something like, let's start with Dolby Vision. Sure. Um, one of the stories I love to tell that I think gives some, some breadth to, to how we think about and uh, Dolby Vision evolves. So go back about six years. I'd been at Dolby just you know, a little bit of time. And we were, if, what we were working on, it was the, the nascent early developments of Dolby Vision. Uh, if you, what we like to do is attack problems where we think there's a huge gap in the perceptual experience where we can really you know, take it to another level. In this case, you know, your typical display three to four years ago was about 300 you know, candelas per square meter. You, know, other, you might know that as nits. The natural moon is about one to 2,000 candelas per square meter. You know, sunlight on black pavement, about 15,000. So what, what I'm trying to get at is there, there was this huge gap in what technology was sharing with you and what your actual sensory system could handle. And so we were working with a research device we built and uh, you know, I, there was a piece of content we were using, which was highly, it was a, a fire dancer, which is a great piece of content because it's got a lot of richness to it, a lot of bright, you know, specular components. And the, the, the fire, whip, a whip of fire on the, was shown on the display and I felt my body react to it. You know, and as, as a physiologist, this was really kind of interesting. And, and, and the first thing you think is, okay, well, the display ought to be, maybe there's, it's getting hot or, you know, and what we did was get out thermal imaging camera, track the display, completely constant. What we were able to do then is realize we could actually track places on people's faces where they were reacting to the image on the screen, just based on the luminance. We were able to show look, that the image, the, the brightness of the image was able to create, create an experience and engage your physiology in a very authentic way. Just based on the luminance reaching my retina, my brain had never experienced anything that was that bright that wasn't real fire. And so it actually did. And that sort of insight informed how we developed Dolby Vision and what the experiences that we want to see show up on all the different display um, implementations will be. But having this response, we just didn't know it. Is that what you're saying? Or is it that the modern technology enables this experience because we're getting better quality images? Modern technology is enabling the experience. We've been very far away from it for, for many years, and it's only now that we're starting to actually be able to create, a, to, to use technology to get, to engage experiences in ways that are sort of truly um, in, uh, authentic to how our physiology is interacting with the natural world. We want to use technology. Technology is becoming more and more aware of the user and the user's internal state and how it reacts to you and what you know what the next levels can be. Um, in our case, we you know we use many different approaches. Whether it's biophysical, you know, it might be electroencephalogram, EEG, way you know you can capture thermal images. You can look at you. You can learn things about cognitive load and and how engaged people are and how excited they are about a piece of content by just looking at the, the, the diameter of their pupil. Um, so there are a lot of tools to do that. But again, it's you know, what we're really trying to get to, and I think we're finally hitting, is this place where we're able to you know, create rich enough experiences that are fueled by an artist that you know, leave an, a lasting physiological memory. Is it the same idea for Atmos? Does it translate directly, or is it different? Are you seeing different responses from people? Or do they work together? Is there like a tandem scenario, like audio and visual? So, it, it, all of the above. I, mean, you, you, I think one of the power, powers of how we think about technology and the future of technology is you can't, it can't be about sound and it can't be about image. It's about a holistic experience, holistic senses. And you know, we, we absolutely do think about those together, study them together, know the impact of you know, how they're going to intersect. And those are some of the key 
developments that need to happen for better immersive technologies. I mean, Atmos is um, a very unique technology and one that you know we work uh, that just for background, you know, we, we introduced about six years ago um, in the cinema. A big transformation there. You know, your typical cinema experience where you might have 65 speakers in a cinema. Um, they're, they're really organized into banks, and they fire, they would respond based on channel information that would be routed to them. So a few of the really transformational changes we were trying to make there were, you know, every speaker's independent, but the sound coming into the, you know, th there's a data stream attached to every object, every sound, sonic element, and that data stream basically gives sound life in the cinema. It allows, you know, a sound to live on its own, to have information that describes it, where it should be in the, within that space, how diffuse it should be, how loud it should be. You know, the future, it's, it's very real to consider that you could actually, you know, that the metadata and, you know, ca that, that's associated with sounds would also capture the motion that that sound is supposed to, you know, um, <coughs> inspire or cause an audience member to, to experience. You start with great artists, you know, whether it's Bach, uh, <laughs> George Lucas or uh, you know, Hardwell, they all have this amazing understanding of the human brain and human experience. So we go from there to trying to develop what we would call sort of a theoretical model, understanding the principles, but then we've got to quantify them. And quantifying those computational models are really often understanding what, what's this filter the body do to the sound or to, to the image that we're trying to represent, and we've got to be able to actually build that then we start influencing technologies. And then we're building tools that are inspiring new artists. And in that way, I think Atmos is very much doing that. Vision has started to do that. And for me, the discussion with Pixar and how artists are using those tools in those new ways is exactly where I see like the cycle closing. In the cinema, we can, be, we can measure exhalance uh, from people in a cinema, things like carbon dioxide, isoprene, acetone, and be able to tell what movie they're watching, just by looking at the chemical signature. So when you start realizing how much information is out there, I mean, obviously privacy is very important, but um, it, how we're going to socially interact is critical, how we're going to, the expectations we have of our technology and how our technology will engage with us is very important. Should be you know, really helping us be more human, using the, the, the information that we know we can gather in these worlds to make us connect with people in ways that we're able to. And our technology can do that. So that's what we're using this type of insight for, is to know the richness of information and how it is, you know, the saliency, how more engaged people are, both by themselves as well as together. We actually study the impact of social experiences because those are where you have really memorable, powerful, and what, how our technology can best augment that. Um, but, you know, I like to say that it's like getting past, you know, the transient, you know, there's no, it's not magic. It's getting past those transient experiences. The, the things that are rich right now is we want to engage authentically your human experience and give you a memory, an emotion that you take with you.